Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Salesforce Ben LinkedIn Live, where we connect with various thought leaders from around the Salesforce ecosystem to talk about different topics. And today, we are speaking about common Salesforce architecture mistakes. Uh, and this is actually, I think this is our second most popular LinkedIn Live ever. We had nearly 1,800 people register. So thank you very much for being here and spending your morning, evening, afternoon with us, wherever you are in the world. Um, so today we're going to be speaking about common architecture mistakes, and we've got Lars Malmquist, who is a Salesforce CTA, Certified Technical Architect, which is one of the highest, is the highest Salesforce certification you can achieve, um, and author of a book about anti-patterns as well. And that's what we're going to be learning about today, Salesforce anti-patterns, which are going to help us to understand common mistakes with Salesforce architecture. Just a few housekeeping things before we kick off. So this is a webinar, so all lines are muted. Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A with Lars at the end. Uh, so uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And this will be recorded and will live on YouTube after, after this. Sorry, that was my cat. Uh, just just uh, in case you wanna watch it again, it'll be on YouTube. Um, there will also be a book giveaway for, uh, for Lars's book at the end. So pay attention to the webinar because there's gonna be a question at the end and you'll be in for a chance of winning his book. So just to introduce myself, my name is Ben McCarthy. I'm the founder of salesforceben.com and I'm gonna be your host for today. And I'm very happy to introduce Lars. Hello, Lars. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, no, well, um, no, great to, to, to have so many people interested in, uh, in Salesforce architecture. That is uh, really promising for, for the ecosystem, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you for the for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, so, I'll hand um, it to you now. I'll see you later. Yeah, that is perfect. I will. Um, I'll get started now. Just sort of to set the scene. Um, I guess as as architects, we tend to spend a lot of time studying good practice um, patterns for doing things the right way, and uh, that is of course incredibly valuable. But um, over the last few years, I've come to think that studying sort of failure modes, so things that go wrong reliably in Salesforce uh, projects over and over again, actually can be just as valuable because it gives you a different perspective on what uh, good architecture is. And it gives you a, more importantly, a, a way to start thinking about how you can avoid these, uh, these repeated errors. Um, and I wrote a book about that topic where, where I sort of analyze these common mistakes through the the concept of uh, anti-patterns, which uh, I'll explain in a bit. However, uh, to start with, I would actually like to tell you a little story about a Salesforce project. Um, so the, the project is uh, for a company called uh, Simple Cleaning Products, and they are a manufacturer of uh, eco-friendly cleaning products. Um, they sell principally to, to B2B customers on a white label basis. So, you know, if you're if you're a cleaner or a chain store and you want your own own line of uh, eco-friendly cleaning products, uh, Simple Cleaning Products will, uh, will supply them for you. Um, they do have a small direct-to-consumer business. Um, that they run via a bespoke e-commerce site that they've uh, they've built themselves. Um, that's about 10% of revenue, so you know, um, small but still a significant part. The company is actually quite new. It was spun out three years ago from a, from a large conglomerate uh, in order to be able to grow quickly on its own, and it has grown you know exponentially from about 200 to 1,200 people. Now that has caused a lot of confusion. Um, both in terms of the processes and in terms of the organizational structure. And to address some of those problems, they are now doing a large scale sales transformation where they want to create a unified way of selling that integrates e-commerce, field sales and marketing in you know, one, uh, one coherent unit. So they've chosen Salesforce as the digital platform to support this transformation. They have been using Salesforce on a small scale already. Uh, so they've got uh, sales and service cloud. Um, that's been used as point solutions for uh, particular teams and not sort of deployed widely and um, has been built by a combination of in-house resources and a few uh, small partners. Now they're going sort of all in on Salesforce and uh, the new technology stack is uh, going to consist of upgraded versions of their existing sales uh, and service cloud. Um, 
and then they will um, they, these will be adapted to accommodate the changes from the sales transformation, and then they will introduce a new e-commerce layer, um, both for their uh, existing um, direct-to-consumer site and uh, a new site for for B two B digital commerce, which they haven't been doing um, for the past three years. So um, both of those will will be deployed using uh, the B two B commerce product from Salesforce. In addition, they will uh, introduce a customer community uh, for self-service uh, customer support and uh, an internal community will be created to to help uh, with some collaboration activities and also to provide uh, employee employee services within um, simple cleaning products they will support the sales processes uh, using marketing cloud account engagement um, uh, effectively to help the b2b flows via lead nurturing and uh, um, other marketing automation flows so the way that they are going to implement the product is um, by having an internal team that uh, basically project manages uh, the, the the process and uh, helps liaise with internal stakeholders and things like that and then they're on onboarding two larger partners um, who will carry out the implementation one of them will focus on the e-com and the marketing side and one will focus on the core clouds and the analytics side and that's kind of how they split the cake between them and that you know all sounds great um, until they actually sort of start getting into the project. And the project uh, hasn't gotten very far before there are a number of complaints from uh, from both of the new partners about the the standard of documentation that is uh, is found for the existing environment. So there's basically, you know, there's no structured documentation artifacts. There is, uh, you know, no system landscape, no uh, uh, list of integration points um, and uh, I mean what's there is mostly just sketches or PowerPoints or Word docs that are discussing specific details in whatever way you know seems to have been um, communicable to to internal stakeholders there are also other problems with the existing environment so first there seems to be a lot of duplicate fields in the data model um, where basically on the same object there are multiple fields doing the same thing um, there, are all, there are also what appears to be duplicate uh, objects. So on the um, service cloud side, they seem to have created a custom object to hold a bunch of customer information, much of which is duplicated in you know, standard account and contact. Um, on the sales side, they have a object for sales inquiries, which uh, you know, looks especially like case. Then they have another problem um, that the, the partners discover uh, relatively quickly. So there's basically, for the sales cloud implementation, there is a 3,500 lines um, Apex class that for all intents and purposes contains the entire business logic of the application. Um, so that includes all of the trigger logic, logic for batch jobs, and even logics for, for making some integration callouts all live in this one monster class. So, you know, the team goes back and they talk to the people involved in the, in the original implementation and, you know, no, no one really knows why things are that way. The, the partners uh, and the people doing it were mostly left to their own devices. So, you know, anyone who knew why things are the, the way they are, they, they, they're not involved anymore. Um, at this point, the partners and the internal team, they, uh, they go back and they make a pitch to the, to the steering committee for the project that they really need a technical cleanup phase to the existing project uh, because they have to alleviate all of this uh, this technical debt and, and and get some better documentation in place. However, they are told that the budget that has been released is has only been released to uh, to implement the new uh, the new platform. So, uh, you know, they can't really really fund remediation work out of uh, out of that. Um, so they have to proceed, which they do. They go into a discovery phase where they start engaging stakeholders. Um, you know, each each stream works more or less independently, and um, you know, at this stage, that's fine. Uh, on the core cloud and analytics side, things progress more or less smoothly. You know, stakeholders are are aware of Salesforce already, and and they kind of know um, how things work. However, on the e-commerce side, um, they run into into major issues. So. 
there are a lot of meetings between uh, the partners, uh, business analysts and the internal team, uh, especially with the, the direct to consumer team to talk about, you know, the capabilities of B2B commerce, how to move the existing site over into that framework, what's the implementation process, um, how's it going to look like. Um, and every time they have the meeting, there's, you know, a barrage of questions and they basically seem, you know, to be the same questions repeated over and over again. Uh, and, you know, the partner is getting quite frustrated because they feel that no, no matter how many times they try to explain things, there, there is really no understanding or agreement. So things escalate as, as they do, and uh, a senior manager steps in um, to mediate the situation. And what turns out to be the case is that actually the, actually the direct-to-consumer team are, are very happy with their current way of working, where they have, you know, they have more or less full control of all the changes. They collaborate closely with a small digital agency. And they simply don't believe that they will have the same kind of flexibility uh, and control, especially around the customer experience, with the new model that's being proposed. And, you know, to some extent, that's true. Um, so the situation is, is at a bit of an impasse. And the question is, you know, shall we, shall, do we need to push it through? Do we need to, to change the scope? What's the situation? But luckily, uh, an architect from the implementation partner has a chance conversation with a colleague from another country. And uh, that colleague mentions that um, they've actually built a package called ComUX that's designed to give um, improved options for customizing the UX uh, dynamically on uh, uh, Salesforce B2B commerce sites. And that will give the, the client the kind of control that they want over the, the overall experience, right? So it's much closer to what they're used to, to making because they can customize um, everything with, uh, um, with their own resources. Um, so they do a demo of this package to the direct consumer team and, um, you know, it's a huge hit. They love it. They accept this as the way forward and, uh, you know, the deadlock is broken. Um, and you know, the, the, they, they can finally continue with the discovery process, although with uh, serious delays. And, um, as you know, as happens, word gets around to, to the other teams about this new awesome package that has uh, solved all the problems over on the on the direct -to consumer side and in quick succession the teams working on uh, the b2b side of e-commerce and both the internal and the external community uh, teams they decide to adopt this uh, this package for their parts of the project because you know it's it's just really cool um, and it's obviously solved a lot of problems in the on the d2c side however as the as they proceed to with building out the functionality, that turns out to be a little bit problematic, right? So the package works really well for the B2C requirements that it was pitched at, right? It seems to have much less functionality on the on the B2B side, um, and uh, basically no functionality for 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 things like internal community uh, use cases. Um, so there are a number of workarounds and, and additions that need to be added to this package in order to get it to work in the other contexts. Um, additionally, it requires a lot of customization to be done in uh, in JavaScript, which for the for the direct consumer team isn't a problem. They've got lots of capability there, uh, but the other teams they they don't like. They have much less uh, much lower skill levels with JavaScript, and so they make much slower progress on their part of the project. Um, this effectively means that a bunch of scope has to be dropped in order to uh, to, to accommodate uh, uh, the different way of, uh, of doing things. And um, unfortunately, this isn't the only problem that hits during the build phase, right? So the partners working independently uh, worked quite well in the beginning. Again, it, it allowed the, the team working on core clouds and analytics to move uh, much faster while the the e-commerce uh, side were were sorting out their issues but um, after a little while uh, a serious issue is reported by the test team so they basically complain that um, automation logic is is getting too confusion confusing um, they don't even really know what to fully expect when they save different kinds of records um, and it turns out that there hasn't really been a lot of coordination between the partners on the on the automation architecture for the build. So um, there are 
different trigger frameworks running. Um, there are different flows running on the on the same objects. Um, and there's also still the question of the legacy code, right? These 3,500 lines of Apex code that nobody has really looked too hard at. Um, so with all of all of those moving parts together means that actually what is meant to happen is a little bit unclear. Um, there's a bunch of discussions around it where you know different parties point fingers at each other, but ultimately a decision is made that um, the project is, project is now too far down the road um, to try to refactor the, the automation architecture. So they'll have to live with the multiple approaches and um, simply agree a process for fixing bugs uh, related to automations across the teams. Now, a, a second serious problem comes from the sharing model. So early in the discovery process, they didn't spend a lot of time on sharing requirements because you know, they were expecting them to be quite simple. However, well into the design phase, the company's DPO flags a number of concerns, some related to consumer privacy, especially in heavily legislated uh, jurisdictions, uh, and some related to, to competition law, where there's concern around whether you can share all of the data between the direct to consumer business and the and the B2B white label business or whether there, there are competitive concerns there. So there's a bunch of sharing requirements which are effectively drip fed into the project. And each um, each is implemented more or less as it comes and using a, a large range of, of sharing mechanisms. You know, there's obviously the, the, the role hierarchy, sharing rules, Apex sharing, um, team-based sharing, and th they just keep adding on. Um, as more test data is loaded, then again, the test team finds it very difficult to understand exactly what records should be visible to different personas that they're testing with. Um, and all in all, all of these issues, uh, along with the, the, the legacy issues that are still there um, from the old code base, makes, means that as the project sort of approaches the UAT uh, deadline, people are getting nervous. Now that turns out to be justified. Like the UAT goes badly, several end-to-end -end processes can't be tested uh, due to automation errors. Um, users expect to have access to information, but don't uh, have the right permissions. Uh, and what's worse, there, there seems to be some information that's shared seemingly to everyone that shouldn't be. Um, so users are also finding it hard to validate the output of reports because the data is spread across, uh, across different uh, objects. And it's not entirely clear what, uh, what should be counted and what shouldn't. In addition, there's just a general, you know, high bug density um, and lots of legacy issues uh, with the uh, with the old code base. So the steering committee convenes and uh, they decide to postpone the go live for a month. I know one on the project really believes that they can do everything that needs to be done in a month, but it's as much as they can get. So everybody, you know, starts working, but in particular, you know, a small sub team containing three of the best performing uh, members uh, across across the partners um, who have quite a quite a broad knowledge of the solution they they, they effectively you know join together and say okay we will we will make up a coalition of the willing and we will take it upon ourselves to to, to get the job done right um, we have the between us we have enough skills that we can we can solve most of the issues so they work effectively day and night for the next month um, to close bugs and uh, and get final features ready, and you know by what seems to be a miracle, the system passes its second UAT. Not with flying colors, but at least there are no show-stopping bugs, and uh, and the system can go live. The response from users, however, is is predominantly negative. You know, business users complain the system is slow, it's buggy, it doesn't do everything it needs to do. Um, during the hyper care period and even beyond, these three people who who <laughs> work themselves to death to to get it live, they keep having to step up and do uh, do firefighting, and they seemingly never get a chance to really rest. Three months after the go live, all three have left for for new positions. Um, the steering committee, at the about the same time, registers that the pace of bug fixes and new features has has slowed to crawl. And uh, they make a decision to effectively put the system on ice, which is to say that it will continue in normal operation, but they're not going to invest any more in it to fix anything unless it's it's a breaking bug. At the leadership level within uh, 
uh, simple cleaning products, you know, they're starting to raise a number of uh, questions about, you know, the value of Salesforce as a platform, whether it was the right choice and whether the partners who, who did the implementation, um, you know, actually knew what they were doing. <clears throat> and that's where, where we'll leave the story for, for today. So what went wrong here? Like what happened here? If you've been around Salesforce implementations for a while, you probably recognized a few of the, the events that I've described, right? It's a, it's a constructed example, but uh, I, I've personally seen pretty much all of these elements happen uh, on one project or another. And the reason why some of these events might seem familiar is that I've constructed this story based on common anti-patterns from the world of uh, Salesforce implementations. So what is an anti-pattern? So my, my favorite definition is that an anti-pattern is a decision that seems like a good idea at the time that when you make the decision, but reliably leads to a bad outcome. So an anti-pattern is different. Um, so the uh, anti-patterns are different from, uh, from bad practice insofar that uh, You know, a bad practice is just, you know, a, just a bad idea. An anti-pattern is something where you can convince yourself that it's a good idea and that given the pressures that you're under and um, the stage the project is at, um, it, it, it can be the right decision. It might not be perfect, but it, but, but, but it can be, be the right decision. However, reliably, it leads to a bad outcome, right? So in this uh, story that we just uh, went through, I've... Uh, included eight anti-patterns um, sort of throughout the, the, the project timeline, right? Um, in the beginning of the story, right, they, 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 they start up by inheriting three anti-patterns uh, from a past implementation, right? So they go in and they figure out that there is no uh, good, implement, good uh, documentation. The documentation that's there is in um, a very uh, idiosyncratic format. And uh, I mean, often when you're working on a project, especially a smaller project, it can seem quite wasteful to produce lots of documentation. It's, you know, it's easy to just get by with whatever minimal thing can be understand and understood by you and your stakeholders. And that works fine, as long as you're in the same team with roughly the same people doing continuous development. If, however, you are changing to a large scale um, transformation program, you have to onboard several new development partners, you have significant changes of personnel in, in your team, then it's not fine anymore, right? Then, then there's a huge cost to doing, uh, to doing that uh, retroactively. So, you know, with Salesforce, we're actually blessed with things like a common diagram framework that Salesforce provides, a lot of good practice and examples to learn from. Um, so, you know, using the standard formats, um, even if you are not producing a lot of documentation, produce it in the in, in, in standard formats really, really helps these kinds of scenarios. Now, the second one we saw was that we've got these duplicated things in the in the data model. So there's a data architecture anti-pattern called disconnected entities, which is refers to a situation where you've got uh, all of these du duplication in the data model, usually because teams work in isolation, they don't, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have control over the, the entire solution. So they just kind of do what works for them in their own context, which again, locally works fine. But when you then scale it up and you've got multiple teams doing that, you get uh, redundancy, you get duplication, you get uh, um, bad data quality and, uh, and difficult reporting, right? So another, another quite common one when you, um, when you evolve a platform over time. The third one they, they inherit is um, a classic code level anti-pattern. It's called God class. It uh, exists in pretty much every object oriented uh, programming language out there, um, of course, including Apex. And uh, a God class is a class that effectively either by design or by evolution ends up containing most or all of the business logic of the application, right? And they usually originate by convenience it is often easier in the beginning to put everything in one place and then we don't have to think about object-oriented design and how to uh, create a, a reasonable representation of uh, our, our object model and um, 
you know, if I start doing that, then it's kind of self-reinforcing because after a while it gets hard to put stuff other pla in, in other places because I would need to refactor uh, quite a lot of my existing code base. But it's a real problem um, because it needs to very fragile applications, right? Everything is effectively coupled to this one class. So whenever I change anything, I need to make a change in the God class. Any error in the God class can potentially um, have uh, repercussions across a wide range of different uh, different functionality. So um, it, it makes applications really brittle. And this is one of the ones where, you know, the technical practices that you have in your team um, really matters. And then we move into sort of the analysis space um, of the project. And there we saw a, a communication level anti-pattern known as uh, Groundhog Day from the movie of the same name. And um, it refers to, to, to the situation where you repeatedly try to explain uh, the same thing over and over again or get consensus for a way forward. And every time you do that, there are more questions that you feel you've already answered many times over, uh, but they just keep popping up and you never, you know, you feel like you're having the same meeting over and over again because you, you never make any progress. And that uh, anti-pattern tends to occur when you have an underlying issue that's not being addressed, right? So, you know, in our example, we have a, a resistance to a change in way of, ways of working. Like we, we don't want to change our ways of working, so we're gonna try to, to be difficult about it, right? In general, to quote um, the consultant Peter Block's book, Flawless Consulting, which I thoroughly recommend, um, you should probably adopt the rule that if you try to explain something three times to an audience in three different ways, and um, they still don't understand it, it's probably not that they don't understand it. You're probably dealing with resistance and you need to approach the problem at a different level, right? So in, in our example, we had a, had a senior manager intervene, but maybe um, that, that would, if they'd realized this a little bit sooner, they could have, um, could have addressed the problem in a, in a, in a different way um, by engaging with the real concerns of the, of the direct consumer team. Now, the problem, uh, the in in the example that I uh, that I gave, the Groundhog Day anti-pattern led straight into a different anti-pattern called the Golden Hammer. So the Golden Hammer happens when you've got some kind of uh, piece of kit, right? Some some particular uh, some particular solution component or a new feature, um, and it get it gets uh, effectively a halo effect, right? Often because there's you know it's successful. Um, in one particular use case, or you, it ha you, you prototype it, it works really well in a prototype, or you see a demo and the demo is just blows your mind. And then what happens is that, you know, while it, you know, it's probably a good solution to the, to the thing that you originally intended it for, but because it gets this, uh, you know, golden aura, uh, it starts getting applied to all sorts of other, uh, other areas as well, where it may be much less well suited, right? So the golden hammer is effectively the mistake of thinking that a solution which works successfully in one context will also be successful in a whole range of different co contexts. And that, of course, doesn't follow, right? So hence why you need to be a little bit conservative about uh, introducing new tools. And then we see uh, two serious um, technical anti-patterns in the build phase. First, uh, we saw one that's called automation bonanza, which happens frequently, unfortunately, in, uh, in Salesforce, uh, in a Salesforce context, um, largely because there's a lot of ways of doing automation architecture on Salesforce. There are a lot of different options. And um, if those options are not aligned properly and you don't have a clear set of practices around them, then it's very easy to get coordination issues between different automations. Um, and that's what we see in, in our example. We see that there are you know three different approaches. Like the partners have each their own approach, and then there's the legacy approach um, that was already in the um, in the existing org. And ultimately, what can happen is that you get unpredictable behavior um, on uh, save and update, and you can also often frequently end up with performance issues and, and, and errors that are quite difficult to debug. So you know, want to say. Uh, a standard for how you do auto automation architecture is nearly a must once you reach a non-trivial size for a, for a Salesforce project. 
then we saw a second one, uh, which I, I call spaghetti sharing model, right? You're probably aware of the concept of spaghetti code, right? It's when, when code just uh, calls each calls um, across uh, all sorts of boundaries without having any seeming structure. So when you try to map out what, what actually happens, it looks like a, a bowl of spaghetti. Now, on Salesforce, you can achieve much the same effect by using too many um, sharing mechanisms around the same objects uh, and same records. Because, I mean, there are there are a lot. There's probably 30 odd, depending on how you count. The, 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 there's, there's 20, 30 different ways of doing sharing in Salesforce. Um, and once you start combining you know, the role hierarchy, org wide defaults, different kinds of sharing rules, Apex sharing, team-based sharing, and so on, um, around the same um, same set of records, it can get really, really complex. And at some point, it just gets too too complex for for anyone to keep in in their mind. And it can even get so complex that trying to map it out on uh, on paper is 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 a nearly futile exercise, right? So that means that eventually you can end up in a situation where it's really hard to understand why a record is or isn't shared. You need to effectively have tooling to, to determine why a record is or isn't shared. Um, so again, you know, it tends to happen when you do incremental build of sharing requirements. So with sharing, actually taking a step back and uh, having a an architecture concept for it and being, you know, parsimonious with the sharing mechanisms that you use um, can, uh, can really help avoid some problems uh, over time. Even though, I mean, I, the, the paradox with this one is also that like, in most cases, like we want to build things incrementally, we want to do things step by step, we want to meet user requirements. It's just that with sharing, when we do that, actually we can end up with a, in, in, in a spaghetti-like mess. Um, so it's a little bit different than, uh, than many areas. Now, then there's uh, the last one, which we see around the, around the go live, is, a, is an anti-pattern that almost everyone who has been doing sort of technology implementations for a while can relate to. And that's the, that's the hero anti-pattern where an individual or a small sub team, you know, repeatedly end up having to save a project or put out fire by just working really hard, uh, usually because they've got some kind of special knowledge. Um, and let's be clear, you know, like occasionally heroics are warranted, right? If somebody steps up to solve a burning issue, you know, that's not a problem. That's, you know, that's great. Give them a bonus. However, if you end up in a situation where every time you need to get something done, every time there's a burning issue, the only way you solve them is by somebody being a hero, then you've got a, um, then you've got an anti-pattern, right? Because, you know, a hero is not scalable, right? You can't, you know, just take a hero and you know, clone them over and over again, although that would be lovely. Um, and I mean, effectively, you have a, also a very strong single point of failure, right? That, that person goes away, you have lost an awful lot of knowledge, and they probably didn't have time to do documentation um, or um, hand over because they were so busy doing heroics, right? So that um, is another one that says go. So you can see, like in this little example, right, we've got got eight um, anti-patterns. Um, but, you know, where where do they come from, right? What uh, And what can we do about them, more importantly? So I want to say that uh, misalignment and poor coordination between various parts of the organization and the way that you do your implementation is, is, is quite often a factor, right? So in our example, we have a misalignment between the expectations of the direct-to-consumer team and the way that we want to implement. We also have misalignment between the partners um, and how we should do governance between the different partners. We probably have relatively weak um, project management on the on the client side, um, and that you know that whole misalignment and coordination issue sort of contributes to a number of the the, the uh, anti-patterns we see. You know, it certainly is. Uh, is the cause of the, of the Groundhog Day anti-pattern we see. It's, it's a contributing factor to automation bonanza, golden hammer, and probably spaghetti sharing model as well. So spending more time and energy on alignment and uh, coordination can really pay off in terms of avoiding anti-patterns because a lot of anti-patterns happen 
when you take things that locally work for each individual team and you scale them up. And then there's a conflict when you look at it uh, um, at a at a higher level for, uh, of the of the entire solution of the entire of the entire org, right? So when you split things up and each part of the system optimizes locally, and you then roll it up, that can lead to to real real issues at the at the higher level. So second, you know, missing technical governance is a big cause of uh, of anti patterns, right? If you don't have standards for how to do things, if you don't have things that tell you what the if you don't have people who can look at something and say, okay, this actually has a an impact somewhere else, if you don't make those kinds of uh, of assessments and you don't have a standard for for um, the way that you do architecture and design that helps people make the right decisions, that is, uh, you know, a surefire way to 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 get technical anti patterns, you know. The ones among the ones that we saw, disconnected entities, golden hammer, automation bonanza, and spaghetti sharing model, would all have been at least alleviated in 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 this scenario if we had better technical governance, right? Um, if we had a data model, if we had better data model governance, we wouldn't have had duplicate objects. If we'd had uh, um, some kind of way of evaluating new products that we bring in, we could have avoided the golden hammer. If we'd had an automation architecture framework, we could have avoided automation and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that can really matter. Um, same is true of, of technical practices, engineering practices. They can they can make a huge difference, especially when you're looking at the, at code level anti patterns, but also you know, at uh, at things like automation and. Um, uh, and sharing could also uh, can also benefit from a you know a clear way of doing things, and there are there are different ways of doing things, but uh, what's important is that you have one that uh, that coordinates these uh, these different activities. So finally, I mean, there is a a bias towards short term wins, and uh, uh, that's probably quite. Quite natural, and that that usually comes with a sense of over optimism about you know what we can actually achieve in the future. So a lot of the time, you know, people will stop, step up, and they will say, you know, well, we'll be heroes because you know then we'll get it over the line, and then it'll be fine, and then we can then we can rest. But in reality, like if the if the problem is is structural, if the problem is that we have uh, you know misaligned stakeholders, weak governance, and uh, different parts of the organization that want to do things in different ways, um, then, yeah, the heroics will will solve the problem right now, but it will not solve the wider problem, right? It's just going to recur. Um, and the same with uh, with a lot of anti other uh, anti-patterns, you know, there can be a, a temptation to pick the short-term win, and that's, that's very natural and very human. However, anti-patterns only only evolve over time. So if you're not aware of them, um, then the the decision you make uh, based on on your local situation and your and your relatively short time horizon um, is very likely to contribute to 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 making a choice that leads to an anti pattern. So What should our key takeaways be from the kind of story that uh, that I've been been telling today? And I've got uh, sort of four key takeaways that that I would like to share um, as part of this talk. The first is that you know, learning how to spot anti patterns often allows you to avoid them because a lot of these things they don't require massive resource investments um, to avoid, right? Um, you can uh, put in place some standards or connect coordination mechanisms early on in a project, and you can you can avoid having you know automation bonanza or spaghetti sharing model occur, and that doesn't necessarily cost a huge amount of uh, of, of time and effort. It just requires better alignment, right? Better agreement. Um, again, in the Salesforce ecosystem, we've got lots of good practice that we can uh, that we can learn from. Um, lots of samples of. Uh, of how to do these kinds of things that we can we can take as a starting point. 
and um, I, uh, for, for many projects that will that would really help so second you know sometimes you can't avoid antibodies but generally speaking you can uh, you can mitigate them so in our scenario we inherited three antibodies right we we had bad documentation we had uh, disconnected entities and we had a we had a god class um and you know in in my story the team just decided to live with them right we we couldn't get the get the funding to fix it so so we live with them right that's basically what happened now what if they decided to say well okay we can't get formal funding to uh, to do anything about it but uh, maybe we can introduce a common technical track between the the partners and our in-house resources and that technical track can work on on technical issues that are uh, that are in common and um, they, that will also include refactoring some of the legacy, legacy code as and when it's possible under the umbrella of the larger project, right? Um, that could probably have helped solve some of the issues. It wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have fixed everything, but there is probably enough stuff touching around those areas that you can do some refactoring um, that has a relatively low amount of impact on, uh, on resource, resource expenditure and, uh, and timeline um, that, would, that would help mitigate some of these uh, these legacy issues. Third, I think I've made this point already, which is that technical governance and engineering practices really matter, right? In terms of in terms of avoiding um, anti patterns, it's one of the most important things that you can spend your time on. And uh, I mean, often governance is kind of seen as a bit of a formality, and a lot of architects would rather spend their time designing things or um, working with the teams than, uh, than than doing you know governance and actually i think that's a bit of a shame because if you've got well defined technical practices and a strong flexible governance model there's a whole range of these anti-patterns that you see over and over again that just are not likely to occur at least if the the people um doing this kind of uh, governance work know what they're doing so, and that doesn't mean that every project needs a formalized BMO, a design authority with a strong mandate, a change board, formal standards for all kinds of coding and configuration, but you do need something, right? Even if that's just a, a coordination forum between the various architects and uh, some standards that you take from, you know, developers at Salesforce, that at least is a starting point. And it obviously depends on your scale and all of that, but, uh, but you need enough um that it is appropriate for the scale of project that you're doing right if it's a very large scale project you probably need quite a formalized uh, governance model if it's quite a small project maybe you just need some people who have meetings every now and again and uh, and some standard documentation but you need something and finally i think thinking in terms of anti-patterns is is a really good way of appreciating the reality of the statement that architecture is about trade-offs. You know, I think we all in theory know that, you know, like there's always trade-offs to be made, no architecture is perfect, no solution is perfect. However, when you see descriptions of anti-patterns in action, you can often sort of viscerally appreciate that in the particular situation that leads to this anti-pattern, there probably wasn't a great solution. There wasn't a, a near perfect solution. And then, you know, in comparison, the anti-pattern ended up seeming like a, a pretty good choice under the circumstances, right? And you only discover the negative consequences over time. Um, and, you know, I think if you appreciate that, that you, you that often you find yourself in technical projects in, in situations where you can't get a perfect solution, you can't get the solution that you really want, um, then you can start thinking in terms of, well, what would be the better solution? What would be the less bad solution? What is the solution that does not lead to um, serious negative long-term uh, consequences, you know, exemplified by anti-patterns? Um, and I think that is that is quite helpful um, as, a, as, a, as a thinking exercise for, for, for practicing architects. And with that, I will end my uh, my presentation for today. Um, but before we hand over to Q and A, as uh, Ben promised, we have a a little quiz. Um, and um, basically, this is a book giveaway. We will be giving away three books to um, uh, three of you that uh, that that will answer the question that I'm about to ask. So I'm going to ask a, ask a question, 
and uh, you should put the answer in um, a LinkedIn comment. And among the ones that answer, uh, among everyone who answers, we will pick three winners at random after the event is over. Uh, one will get a print book and two will get ebooks. Um, and we will send that out to you. So um, here is the question. So what is the name of the anti-pattern that describes the scenario when you end up with so many different kinds of automations running on key objects that no one really understands the full behavior anymore? Write your answer in the comments now. I'll give you, you know, 30 seconds or so. This probably had my, uh, my favorite name out of all the anti-patterns, Lars, so. I'm sure it's sticking people's, stick people's minds. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, right? You know, like part part of um, the value of anti patterns, uh, I should say, is is that by giving something a name and thinking about it, um, yeah. it becomes much easier to spot in the wild, right? Uh, because you can, you know, you can say, ah, that's that's automation, uh, that's uh, whatever pattern that uh, I was about to say, that's the answer to the question, um, that, uh, or that's a God class or whatever, right? I, I, I can name it, I can, I can point at it, and I can see it in advance. And that, that is also really helpful, I think. Yeah, no, 100%. And I, um, there, was a, there was a little pause, and I was worried that no one would get it. But now I can see about 100 responses. <laughs> my, favorite right. is, my favorite is automation spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, shall we go to Q&A? Yeah, let's do it. Um, and just, just to let you know, the right answer was automation bonanza. So thank you for everyone. There was a few people who put automation spaghetti, actually, which does make perfect sense. That <laughs> so. is, uh, I, I love that, actually. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, but this is great. Yeah, no, thanks so much for that presentation, Lars. It was, I'd never heard of anti-patterns before I started talking to you about this presentation, but I think I could relate to a lot of the issues but it was nice to see them laid out kind of with the um the people aspect intersected with it as well like not being able to get something through to someone and yeah so so really interesting to see thank you um we do have some time for questions so um we'll try and get through to as many as possible if you do have any please drop them in the chat um i saw someone quite early on uh, anastasia um, Lars, would you mind giving some examples of standard documentations when you were speaking about the anti-pattern about documentation? Yeah, so I, I mean, I mean the, the things that you would expect to see in a Salesforce project, so I think like a, things like a, a system landscape, um, an overview of all of the integration points, um, an overview of the sharing model, um, maybe a configuration workbook if it's a, if it's a, larger, if it's a larger project, right? Um, and if you go to the Salesforce Architects website, they've actually got um, a lot of good collateral around this, um, especially the, the Salesforce diagram framework. I can, I can really heartily uh, recommend. I think everybody should be, be using that to, doing their, to do their diagrams um, going forward. So, um, but that's the kind of thing I mean when, we're, uh, when, when I mean standard documentation. And what you sometimes see with the, with non-standard documentation is that somebody will just draw a picture, right? They because they're communicating internally in the team and they understand each other, they'll just draw draw a little picture, do a little PowerPoint, and then make some notes. And that made perfect sense at the time, but it doesn't make sense to me when I come in as a new supplier and uh, and need to take over. Great, thanks, Lars. Um, quick question from Jane that I'm qualified to answer. Is this recorded? Yes, it is, and it'll be on YouTube afterwards. Our YouTube channel. Maybe someone can link the uh, our youtube channel in the in the chat so you can thank see you that. jane appreciate that <laughs> uh, right here's a uh, quite a long one um i'll quickly try and summarize it so anders is talking about the lack of change management is a common part uh, left uncertain in many projects so would you consider lack of change management an anti-pattern so that is a really interesting question. It depends on where you, where we put the put the scope around the border. Is like we all know that bad adoption on Salesforce projects is probably the number one you know the one number one issue with the with with Salesforce implementations is that they end up having bad adoption, right? One of the biggest contrib contributors to to bad adoption is bad change management, right? We did not do the the, the change management properly during during the way. So. 
the question of, of whether I would define it as an, as an anti-pattern is, is, is slightly more sort of definitional. So I think it, it's actually probably too big a thing to be one anti-pattern, right? There's a bunch of things that go into getting change management and adoption right, all of which need to fit together. So I think you could actually probably do you know, another chapter in my book about change management anti-patterns um, that would, uh, in you know, collectively would describe uh, the answer to that challenge. Uh, so, you know, I recognize the challenge. I just think defining, you know, missing change management as as, as one anti-pattern is probably is probably too broad, I guess. Great, thanks, Lars. Um, one from Michelle here. Hi, Michelle. Um, for those new to consulting or an architect role, how do you get better at identifying these anti-patterns or even recognizing a situation uh, that might encourage their appearance? Sounds like a perfect plug for your book. Yeah, I mean, obviously read my book, but uh, but sort of in all in all seriousness, um, I I guess I I tend to think that you learn most about these from you know from concrete examples, right? So talk to people who've been been through a lot of implementations, hear their hear their war stories. Um, also, you know look at as many different Salesforce orgs that uh, that you can get your hands on, look at their configuration, look how they're set up, try to identify where there are, are particular issues. Um, I think those are those are good places to start. And it's not always easy if you're if you're just starting out to to get a hold of those resources, but but when you can, you know, um, I would I would really dig into uh, into those kinds of things. Great, thank you. I, I suppose working in consulting is kind of quite necessary for that, just so you can dive into loads of different orgs and. and yeah, I mean, it, it's it's helpful to, to work in consulting, but maybe you can you can also talk to people at community events and, uh, you know, uh, broader colleagues uh, colleagues in the broader uh, ecosystem, right? I mean, the Salesforce ecosystem is a pretty friendly place. A lot of people are are happy to help if you ask. Yeah, right. True. Um, Great. Um, one from Peter here, uh, quite long, but I'll try and paraphrase. So um, have you seen any examples of anti-patterns on a smaller scale, maybe creating a custom object that weren't needed that actually end up making things more complex? Yeah, I mean, so that's where I think, you know, there's a there's a there's a blurry boundary between what's an anti-pattern and what's just, you know, good practice versus bad practice, right? So something like a custom object can like you know like data model governance has anti patterns like the disconnected entity entities example that uh, that i mentioned um but there's also just you know good practice around don't use a custom object uh when it's not required right don't replicate what's in what's already in a standard standard object right these are these are sort of they're not anti patterns they're just bad practice i would i would say so it's kind of I think there's a little bit of a blurry boundary there. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, a lot of questions coming in. I'll try and get around to as many as possible. Here's, quite, here's a good one from uh, Gerald. Uh, could you elaborate a possible solution for spaghetti sharing? Yeah, I mean, it is really hard to get out of when you're in the middle of it, right? So that's, that's why I was kind of saying with, with sharing, what is really important is that you have a clear sharing architecture in mind up front, and you need to spend the time to do that. So if you end up in, in, in the spaghetti, spaghetti sharing model scenario, then you've got a long period of, uh, of refactoring ahead of you, I'm afraid. Um, that's, that's just how life is. I would still go back to the drawing board, look at all your sharing, sharing requirements, and see if I can figure out an overall sharing architecture that is simpler than what you've got right now that achieves, you know, most of what you've got um, already, and then seeing if I can agree with uh, some key stakeholders that we can live with a slight reduction in complexity of requirements in order to get a much simpler um, overall sharing sharing model. If you can't, and you need to to to, to refactor to a to a simpler model um, after you've already gotten into the into the spaghetti sharing model mess, then you know. You need to do, you need to still define a, a target sharing architecture that you're that you're going for, but then you basically have to work through it, refactoring um, the different rules and uh, uh, and mechanisms as you go along, and that 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 is hard. That's unfortunately the the truth is that is that is quite difficult. 
Yeah. I just have to bring up this answer to your quiz just because I really appreciate it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> um, this, this is quite an interesting question from, from John. So um, imagine you're coming to a project with all the examples you mentioned. Imagine the project is almost impenetrable to understand. Where would you, where would you start? Well, I mean, I like, if I if I get with if I get uh, into an org and it has all of these issues um, and all of this legacy, right? Then, I mean, effectively, I'm I'm in a situation where I need to start like almost reverse engineering what's there, right? So, um, you need to go through systematically through the the application, you need to go through the the, the code, you need to try to understand the different uh, moving parts. You can't do it perfectly, but you know, like documenting like getting that basic documentation what are the like what are the automations on the object I, I i had one project where there were literally you know 12 automation on automations doing different things somewhat overlapping on on a single um on on, on several of the key objects right so to understand that it was you know we go, need to go through all these systematically we need to draw a draw a diagram on a whiteboard figure out how how they all interact and even then it's it's hard but what what you can often do at that that point is to you can point out to that one that one i can i know what to do with then i can take that one away um so so uh, that's the that's the kind of process that you that you need to get through right um and if you know if somebody gives you an orc that looks like the end state of uh, of what we just described and says yeah and uh, now we'd like to to implement cpq please um i mean I'd, that's the point where I would consider just saying no, right? Or this, like, I, I, I don't want this project, right? There is, there is a point where, where it just gets too much. Yeah, can definitely relate to that. Um, really interesting one again from Michelle here. Um, how do you handle conversations with stakeholders about anti-patterns, either saying no when one is suggested or addressing it before one sneaks in? I think labeling it really helps, right? So, you know, pointing it out and saying, this is the name, this is what happens, here is an example. Uh, can you see how this, is, this example is, is, very, um, is very close to, uh, to what we're about to do? Um, so here is what's gonna happen, right? And, um, and, and basically talking people through the, the narrative, right? Because people respond much better to, uh, to, to sort of the story about what's gonna happen than they, than they respond to you know, you just saying this is an anti-pattern, we can't do it. Um, so I think there is, a, there is a lot of sensitivity in handling this with key stakeholders. And then you also very much need a an alternative, right? You need to give them something else. So we can't do this, even though it seems like a good idea, but here's what we can do, right? And that's not gonna have all of these negative consequences. So I think if you've got that, uh, that duality uh, when you when you engage with stakeholders stakeholders and you do it in a in a sensitive way you can you can usually have a have a productive discussion doesn't mean you're always going to win but you can at least have a productive discussion great thanks a lot Lars um there are a uh quite a lot of other comments and and questions but we we do need to wrap up so um thank you very much for for everyone for attending and for all your questions as well this is clearly um, a, a really interesting topic, you know, from the, from the looks of things, a lot of people like me haven't heard of anti-patterns before, and, you know, people are obviously very intrigued. So Lars, thank you very much for joining us today and talking us through this topic. It's, it's been really, really insightful. Um, any last words at all before we wrap up? No, I mean, just thank you. I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that this has resonated with a lot of people and I love the questions, right? And I love the, <laughs> the, the, the automation spaghetti. That is, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, yeah, no, yeah, just thank you very much. And thank you for everyone for attending today. We'll hopefully see you soon on the next LinkedIn Live. So see you later, everyone.